So, super. Thank you very much, Gary, and thank you, um, um, Frederico, for the Italian flavor opening um, to DDL. Um, and it stimulated a lot of discussion on Slido, and we'll probably pick up on some themes here. So, very topically, over the last three or four years, is the whole debate on propellants um, and the environment and, um, uh, and, and climate change. Um, and so we thought we would um, bring together um, a couple of speakers um, that would be able to address this. So um, that was our thinking behind the session, wasn't it, Geralt? Indeed. And um, when we were planning this. Yep. So without further ado, we've got three smashing speakers. I'm going to start off with um, inviting um, John, John Pritchard um, to the podium, who um, is now a private consultant specializing in strategic approaches to developing respiratory devices has had an illustrious career in GSK3, MAZ, and Philips, to name a few, where he launched 11 major products. And um, the reason we've asked you, um, John, is your insight um, with respect to propellants and PMDIs. Um, and you sit on the UN committee that makes re recommendations on the medical uses of propellants covered by the Montreal Protocol. So the stage is familiar to you, John, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Omar. And thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I was chatting yesterday <clears throat> and was accused of being, uh, having been banging a drum for the last couple of years. That drum is getting bigger. And the issue that I think we all face is that the inhaler market could undergo quite a significant transition in a completely uncontrolled fashion. And hopefully over the next 25 minutes I'll be able to convince you of some of the risks and the reasons behind that. So this, as Omar has alluded to, all relates to the greenhouse effect. The earth is warming, that is indisputable. Correlated with that is a significant increase in carbon dioxide. Oops, sorry, wrong way. Um, and if you look, the earth is generally in balance between the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the amount trapped in the earth. The issue is this little piece over here to the right which is what is of anthropogenic origin. And this is the bit that is creating the excess CO2 um, leading to global warming. If we look at what those greenhouse gases are, by far the majority of them uh, are carbon dioxide. But you can see up here, little 2% F gases. These are hydrofluorocarbons, fluorinated um, compounds. and um, of the F gases, hydrofluorocarbons account for 95% of those emissions, of which MDIs only account for about 2%. So we are looking at 2% of the F gas emissions, which are only 2% of the emission of global warming gases, which comes to 0.04%. So why are we worried? Listen on. So, Initially, um, there have been a number of attempts to regulate F gases. It started with the Kyoto Protocol um, in 1997, which extended the UN framework on climate change, went through in Europe the introduction of F gas regulations, uh, further amendments until uh, in 2016, there was an amendment passed to the Montreal Protocol, which at that stage was very successfully phasing out um, the use of CFCs, which were um, damaging the ozone layer, um, and instead started to target on the phase down of F gases. And to date, 138 countries have ratified that new agreement. It set a timetable. Here in green, you can see the European F gas regulations. Europe was ahead of the game. It's still ahead of the game and diminishing more rapidly. U.S. following on, and then under the Kigali Amendment, you have countries including China and countries including India operating to a much more protracted time frame. And that's because these F gases are used in a number of other applications, including refrigeration, air conditioning, which can equally be life-saving. And so um, because in these um, emerging economies, um, they were still developing the use of this technology and deploying it to the population. They succeeded in getting a, a rather more protracted time frame. This is now starting to be enshrined in legislation. So in the States, we have something known as the AIM Act, which was enacted at the end of 2020 to give EPA the powers to regulate what was going on. 
And so they introduced rulemaking, which inter interestingly controlled the import of bulk F gases, but does not actually control the import of product which contains an F gas. So if you make an MDI in Europe, the import to the US is not controlled under the AIM Act. But if you try and ship the bulk propellant to the US to make it in the US, it is. Um, and as part of that rulemaking, there were exemptions or what they called set-aside allocations for six sectors which included MDIs. <clears throat> Fine. MDIs have got potentially five years of exemption before we have to worry. Except that, how many of us have developed and got an MDI product to market in less than five years? This isn't actually a very long time. And indeed, there are uh, provisions within the Act that... Public, members of the public can petition to say, I don't think that MDI is v valuable because I happen to have an alternate dry powder inhaler that does the same thing. So even that five years is not absolutely guaranteed. And then you look at the wonderful state of California, which at the end of September this year passed a bill that said phase down isn't good enough. We are going to phase out. So 227 MDIs will be banned from sale in California from the end of 2030, and all 134A products, including MDIs, will be banned from the end of 32. Only 10 years away. In the EU, they've decided that actually, despite taking the lead, it's not quick enough, and so they have come up with revisions to the FGAS regulations which are currently at the committee stage. I think there will be votes in the European Parliament on the final draft next year. Um, but the proposals currently accelerate the phase down. You can see here the red dotted line compared to the green line. And one of the key critical proposals within this is they've removed exemptions. So where is the original F gas uh, regulations exempted MDIs from the control? Now they are included. And if you look at the level of the exempted um, emissions, by 2027, if nothing is done, they will be about half of all the allowable F gas emissions in Europe. Five years away. Not very long at all. Um, there are various other um, provisions in, in the Act as well that I won't go through for time. But it's not just about um, regulation. If you look at what happens when you make one of the propellants that goes in your MDI, there's a start-up process while the chemical synthesis stabilizes, during which time the impurity levels are quite high. Once the process settles down, you can make product within specification for medical pharmaceutical use. At the moment, all of that bit, which you can see um, accounts for maybe 20, 25 tons, can be repurposed. It can go into a fridge. It can go into air conditioning. It doesn't matter the level of impurities because you're not inhaling them. But as these uses start to get phased out, there will be fewer plants around making propellant-grade material. They will be throwing away or recycling the uh, impure material. The costs will go up. And just to show you what happened during the first um, drop in HFC allocations in Europe, the price of propellant went up sixfold. Now, this is actually the price of refrigerant grade 134A rather than medical grade 134A, but because there was less of it around and less of it being uh, available to repurpose, the price went through the roof. Actually, it came down a bit because the EU in the last round had not um, specifically tightened up enough on import controls, and people were able to import bulk propellant under a claimed exempted use, even when it wasn't. But nonetheless, the price never came back to the original price. It was still about threefold higher. So as all these other uses get phased out, the price of your medical-grade propellant is going to increase. And I think 2025 is the tipping point. Even under the current EU regulations, you can see there's a significant further step down. There's also a big step down in the US, and if the revised FGAS regulations come in, it's an even bigger step down. So 
This is going to put huge um, pricing pressures on medical grade propellant. If it goes up simply the five or six fold that I illustrated earlier, then the cost to manufacture a 134 a MDI is going to rise about threefold. The cost of a 227 MDI is going to go up fourfold. So the margins are going to get squeezed on these products. If the margins are squeezed, manufacturers may say it's no longer economically viable for me to make this MDI and doctors like Omar no longer have the chance to prescribe it because the companies will unilaterally uh, remove it from the market. Interestingly, when Chiesi said they were going to do something about this, they estimate it was going to cost them about 350 million euros to switch to a lower GWP propellant. And if the propellant prices go up sixfold, that project gets paid back within four years. So it wasn't just a great environmental decision, it was a really sound commercial decision as well. Now, one of the interesting things, remember I said you can't import bulk propellant, is that there are now a number of multinational companies from India, Bangladesh, China, who have product registered in Western markets, which will not be captured under these import controls. So whereas the Western-made product is likely, could well go up in price significantly, that being imported from Article um, 5 countries, India, China, may not go up in price because their phase down is much later. They still have access to cheaper um, propellant of, of medical grade. So actually, Omar might need just to simply switch brand of MDI from a current Western manufacturer to, say, an Indian manufacturer and still be able to provide affordable medicine. Unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. So this is a paper that was looking at the um, consumption of F gases in India. They looked at um, air conditioning, mobile air conditioning, refrigeration, chillers. Now, bear in mind the baseline hasn't been set yet, but they projected what the baseline would be, and they said, well, here's this great big increase in the use of F gases in India that's projected over the next few years. Then the Montreal uh, Protocol kicks in, and it starts to come down. <clears throat> but you look over here, 2032. Actually, the projected use is pretty much equal to the entire amount they would be allowed to release. And that doesn't include any medical uses. So a politician in India may suddenly have to make decisions as to whether they provide allocation for inhalers, meter dose inhalers, or whether they do it for fridges. Are you gonna have bad food or bad medicine? So all of a sudden, this is only 10 years away. And India, China, may get caught up in exactly the same issues because bear in mind, this relies on the air conditioning, the refrigeration industries actually starting to transition away from F gases so you're on a downward curve. If they don't do their part of the bargain, these numbers are still going up and there's absolutely no room for MDI propellants. So it really is um, a, a quite critical situation in that the potentially cheaper propellant from countries like India and China actually may disappear far quicker than anyone currently believes. So what can we do about it? Clearly, MDIs have a much bigger carbon footprint because of the emission of the F gases than do dry powder inhalers or soft mist inhalers. <clears throat> can we walk away from them? Omar, I'm sure, will give you my view. Uh, will give you his view. My view is absolutely not. Things you have to bear in mind are, first off, rescue medication. Rescue medication is delivered from a meter dose inhaler because you have a force to, create, to disperse the spray and get it into the lungs. Patients who are struggling to breathe will struggle to get rescue medication from a dry powder inhaler. <clears throat> and if you switch your patient, as we were hearing from Federico in the last talk, you may actually have the opposite effect on the patient that you're trying to achieve by maybe looking after the environment. And so if the patient goes uncontrolled 
actually their carbon footprint because of uh, visits to A&E, maybe an inpatient admission to a hospital, greater use of rescue medication. All that means that their carbon footprint is actually much greater than had you kept them on the MDI in the first place. So patient control is a very key part of this whole um, management scenario. And um, with smart inhalers, AstraZeneca showed that they could improve um, the control of asthmatic children and using a smart inhaler actually reduce their carbon footprint by 50 kilograms of CO2 a year. So we need MDIs. Omar was um, instrumental in helping to craft this ERS statement that says it's all about having the right device for the patient and patient choice is most important. So we need them. How are we going to make them lower global warming uh, potential? There are two propellants out there that are currently being studied, 152A and 1234ZE. Um, 152A has a significantly lower, at least a tenth lower global warming potential than 134, and HFO is another two orders of magnitude below that. <clears throat> if we look first at 152, it's been around for a very long time. It's used in a number of consumer aerosols. Um, it does have a couple of issues with it. One is it has very low density. So if you're trying to formulate a suspension in your MDI, the density difference will make uh, creating that formulation more challenging. And then it is flammable. <clears throat> that means you have to take extra precautions. It's not a showstopper because, as I say, there are millions, if not billions, of aerosols made every year that contain this material already. It's just that you have to modify your manufacture. <clears throat> and to do that, the recommendation is you try and separate the filling of the propellant from the filling of the contents. So you have your can here, you would put your formulation in the can, crimp the valve on, and then move the um, container to an outside facility with a roof that would blow off if there ever was an explosion. And you make it all automated so there is minimal personnel risk. So you can think that you might have a single stage filling vessel in this area, although bear in mind quite often you have to top up um, your batching vessel midway through the run because the propellant has been evaporating and so your formulation has been getting more concentrated. <clears throat> or you could go for a dual stage fill, or maybe you have a two stage fill where you make your formulation as they do here, maybe in an ethanolic formulation, and then move that to a remote gassing area. I mean, obviously, ethanol itself is flammable, so you need to be careful as to how much ethanol is actually involved. Um, or you try and do something slightly different, and you come up with a solid state fill into your valve. And I don't know, could you just click on the video, because I don't think I can from here. Thank you. So this is a self-dispersing tablet that is placed in the can. You then gas propellant in through the valve. The propellant disperses and gives rise to a very stable suspension. Um, I am associated with it, conflict of interest, fully open. Um, this, we have now six months accelerated stability at 4075. It is a very stable product and anyone who's interested can go and visit Rachel uh, in the poster area to find out more about it. But it is an alternative to some of the more complicated procedures you might have to adopt in um, filling flammable propellant. The alternative is HFO. This is a um, 1234ZEE. It's a um, compound that is relatively new, has far fewer um, industrial applications, and it is a more complicated synthesis route than 152. So in all likelihood, because of smaller scale and more complicated synthesis, it will cost more to produce. Um, but it does have the advantage that it has this extremely low GWP. But um, if you're trying to make salbutamol, then maybe the higher cost of the propellant is something to, to bear in mind. Both Honeywell, who um, produce this material, and Cora, who produce the 152, have a number of patents. So if you want to go down this route, 
you may have to talk to those specific producers in order to gain access to the IP portfolio. <clears throat> so three companies have so far bitten the bullet. Chiesi I mentioned, also AstraZeneca, also GSK. If you look, um, this is the market by value, then between the three of them, they actually account for 70% of the NDR market. So you can understand why these three companies took the lead early. However, for these other companies with smaller market shares, <coughs> if there's not going to be an MDI market, what is the incentive for them to transition? As I said, maybe they will simply let the product wither on the vine and die instead of investing in it for the future. If that happens, you end up with one company only making reliever medication and a very limited uh, supply chain with only three companies in total um, for whom, from whom you can get your MDI. And as I said, salbutamol relievers are the issue. So in the first place, um, they account for well over half of doses taken globally. They are incredibly cheap. In the UK, it's about a penny a dose for salbutamol. So there is very little margin in that product to be able to bear increased prices of propellant or valve or, or anything else. And as I say, they, GSK are the only company that are addressing this market. For the others, how do they go about bringing a product to market? Well, in Europe, there is this system that allows you even maybe to get an in vitro bio equivalence on a product. In reality, may need some systemic PK, and in extreme circumstances, you may need some pharmacodynamic studies as well. <clears throat> All of that is relatively low cost and relatively quick. In the US, I've seen no indication that the FDA expect anything other than a full-blown clinical trial. So bear in mind what I said before. California, 227 phased out in eight years. Are you going to start now, get your formulation and your clinical trials to the FDA in time for them to review it, approve it, get product in the market, in the supply chain, and convert the patients across from one propellant to another? Those of us were, that were around for the CFC to HFC transition know none of this is straightforward. So there's a lack of clarity on the clinical requirements. Maybe what you can get away with for a salbutamol, you might not get away with for a triple combination. Um, you have to reconvert all of your filling lines, your supply line. And on the back of that, I know of at least one company who have said, we're doing nothing. We are going to wait and see what low GWP products make it to the market, and then we will try and go for a, a direct generic version of those rather than trying to produce a branded generic instead. So to wrap up, I believe there is an imperative to act and act now. Time is running out. Somebody yesterday described it as one minute to midnight. We need MDIs. I don't think there's any dispute about that. Patients need choice, and patients who are the greenest are the ones that are well controlled on the appropriate medication and device. This is not simply about a phase down. It's increasingly becoming a very draconian phase down, if not a phase out. And the consequence of that is propellant prices will go through the roof, which leaves us with a real problem as to how, for developing countries, there will be an affordable rescue medication, particularly given potentially the patent situation. And the only way you keep price down is if you avoid one company having a dominant market position. So. It's time to act, if you're not already too late. And with that, um, as I think uh, was mentioned in the introduction, I do sit on a UN technical committee that advises parties to the Montreal Protocol on issues surrounding um, now the FGAS transition. Um, we work by consensus. So what you've heard today is very much my views and not the views of the committee. Thank you. So, John, thank you very much for that elegant presentation. And I know you've talked about this topic um, for a good um, few years. Um, we have a question over there. 
Um, uh, Bill Trenerman from UPC. Um, uh, on a personal note, um, sorry, it's a bit low. Um, my wife is currently, she's an asthmatic, and today she currently can't breathe or talk, and she's staying alive, frankly, by using salbutamol, PMDI. So I'm kind of interested <laughs> in this, uh, the PMDI is not being phased out. And I just wondered what your view was, John, with 152 and 1234, whether that has got a hope of really going forward and carrying on what is required by people. Um, I think they definitely will happen. I think those three companies have enough of a market to invest and, and protect that they will see their developments through. The timing is the one that's critical. Um, I am concerned that health authorities are not talking to environmental regulators, and, and there is perhaps a, a, a lack of appreciation amongst the environmental regulators of the unintended co consequences of trying to accelerate a phase down. Um, it will happen. Uh, there may be a price associated with it, and the time frame is somewhat uncertain still at the moment. But the companies that I listed there all are still saying they are tracking to at least starting to roll product out in 2025. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. We have a question over there. Uh, Paul Hardman Thank from you. Broughton. So often, often the harms of compounds are known prior to regulations changing or companies being forced by regulations banning things. Should manufacturers be taking more responsibility to change before bans, before regulations are put in place? Because a lot of the time, the large companies, after all, have policies on global responsibility and, and things like that in place. So do you think the, the onus should be on manufacturers to change or the regulators to force them to change? So um, it, it, it clearly is a bit of both, um, but there is an onus on manufacturers um, most um, reputable pharma companies have net zero targets uh, to be carbon neutral. A lot of them are um, around 2030 as, as the target date. Um, the problem is, and I know of at least one Indian company that claims uh, an MDI they have on the UK market is carbon neutral because they've offset the F gas emissions by planting trees and solar panels to power their factories. So you can be carbon neutral and yet still be subject to, to the regulations. Um, I have been beating the drum really to try and get manufacturers, whether they are um, suppliers or pharma companies, really to, to start to take this seriously. And, and if anything, the regulators may have had an unintended consequence in making it a phase down rather than a phase out because people can use rose-tinted glasses and go, as we currently have with the F-gas regulations today, MDIs are exempted. I don't have to worry about it, or I don't have to worry about it for five years or another 10 years. And, and really what I'm trying to do is to make people aware that the commercial pressures will, could come into play before they're actually ready to respond. Super, thank you. Um, and then the final question, Sandy. Um, um, yeah, yeah I, was just, I was just going to ask if there was any risk that um, disruptive innovation in the application of these propellants in other places, for example, in air conditioning, could en end up resulting in the only application being for medical use. And if that was the case, you know, would that make all these systems uneconomic? Um, I, I think... We're all hostage to, to disruptive innovation at, at different times. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of anything that at the moment is really that close. There are valve manufacturers who are looking at using compressed gases rather than liquefied propellants, um, but they, there is a struggle there um, with the technology, and, and I don't think the technology has yet been reduced to practice for metered dosing uh, accuracy that you need in an MDI. But we keep looking. Super. 
Great, thank you very much. John, thank you very much for your presentation.